right, we're going to begin reading in Genesis chapter number 7, verse number 1. The Bible reads, And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Right here in verse number 1, the very first statement, we find something very profound. That's something that's very easy to read over here in, in Genesis chapter number 7, verse number 1. And it's particular, this is why grammar is important. And understanding different parts of speech and the definition of words, definitions of words. <clears throat> Verse number one, one more time, God says this, And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark. So that one word right there would be very easy to look over, right? If God was outside of the ark, what would God say when he's giving instructions to Noah? Go. So where does God have to be when he says, Come. Inside of the ark. Right. You know what that means is, is, is God is always there to comfort you. Who do we have? The Holy Spirit that dwells with us. Yeah. So even throughout this period of time of, you know, the flood. And, and I'm positive that during this period of time that Noah was frightened. And there was times when Noah was frightened, his wife was frightened, his sons were frightened, and their wives were frightened. I'm sure that there were a period of times, time during this where people on the ark were scared. But God was in there the entire time with them. And we can apply this to our lives as well. It, all the storms that we go through, all the hard times that we go through, when it's scary, you know what you have? You have the Holy Spirit there to be the comforter. You have God there with you the entire time. God never leaves us. You know, God will never leave us nor forsake us. The Amen. Bible promises us that. There at the end of the passage, we saw this last week, but it says, For thee, God speaking to Noah, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. And we know by looking at Hebrews chapter number 11, it's verse number 7 in particular talks about Noah. And it tells you that, his, that he became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. So this righteousness was not a righteousness of his own works because it tells you that he found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So he found grace in the eyes of the Lord and God found him righteous in this generation because of his great faith, the great faith that he had. Look at verse number 2. It says, Of every clean beast, Thou shalt take to thee by sevens, the male and his female, and of beasts that are not clean by two, the male and his female. Now here in verse number two, it's something also that uh, a lot of people kind of read over. They don't realize that Noah did not only take two of each animal, of all animals. He took seven of the clean. Did you notice that? Seven of the clean animals, and then he took two of the unclean. So he took seven of the clean and two of the unclean. And I've heard a lot of people's explanations that, that the seven of the clean were brought so that they could eat the animals, you know, for their nutrition during this period of time. I've heard that probably from two or three different people, and specifically a, a creationist I heard teach this one time, who should be some sort of apologist, you would think, on the Bible. But if they were to just look one chapter over, flip over one chapter, look in uh, Genesis chapter number 8, and look in verse number 17, I believe. Bring forth with thee every living thing that is with thee of all flesh, both of fowl and of cattle and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. And he says that they may breed abundantly in the earth and be fruitful and multiply in the earth. Now skip down verse 20. Yeah, I just wanted you guys to see that verse. It was real important. Verse 20. And Noah built an altar unto the Lord and took of every clean beast and of every clean fowl, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. So you see why he kept these, these animals with him. And there's five of them, because it tells you specifically elsewhere. We read it a couple of times, and it's pretty uh, you know, uh, uh, repetitive when it talks about this, that two of each were specifically brought so that they could breed abundantly, so that they could multiply and replenish the earth, right? So if you think about this, it's very, very interesting that five of those animals only survived that flood until the very end of it. God saved those five animals of the clean, right? Not, you know, you know, more than five animals in particular, but five uh, of, each, of each kind is the specific word that the Bible uses. Not species, but kind. Five of each kind that were clean, he saved them. It would be ten, actually, of each kind. But in this case, he saves them and, and just till the end so that he can sacrifice them. So they're only kept... Throughout this period of time, 
so that he's able to sacrifice them. So that's very interesting. God preserves them during this time, puts them on the flood, they, uh, on the on the ark during the flood, and preserves their lives. And as soon as they get off the ark, Abraham goes and, or I'm sorry, I don't know what's going on with my mind right now. Noah goes and sacrifices them, sacrifices these animals. So that's super interesting. So it's not for nutritional purposes. It's to sacrifice the animals to God. He's like, hey, take them with you. Keep them on the ark. Preserve their lives. And then immediately after that, take them and sacrifice them to me. Now, we'll read more of that here in just a moment. Go back to Genesis chapter number 7. We'll read more of that in a, next week, actually. Go back to Genesis chapter number 7, verse number uh, th uh, 3. We'll read verse 3 now. Fowls also of the air by sevens the male and the female, to keep seed alive upon the face of all the earth. For yet seven days, and I will cause it to rain upon the earth forty days and forty nights. So we see that he actually tells them, you know, seven days prior. He tells them seven, so, so Noah, or yeah, Noah is preparing, you know, the ark. He's building the ark, he's getting everything ready, all the stuff that he needs to do. He's probably trying to do some planning on his own of how he's going to be doing this. God, of course, helped him. But he's preparing himself spiritually in all different types of ways. And you don't know if he's hearing from God all the time. It doesn't tell you that he is. But then God comes to him right before and he tells him, hey, seven days. Seven days now. So you wonder if maybe he didn't speak to him that whole period of time, right? And he, and he comes to him in the beginning to prepare himself, but then he comes, you know, much later, however many years later, like we looked at maybe 70 years later, 60 years later, and then he's like, hey, Noah, we got seven days, man. Imagine that. Imagine you're waiting this period of time. Years and years and years go by. Decades go by. And then God comes back to you after you've built this ark, and he's like, it's time. That'd make you pretty nervous, wouldn't it? Seven days. Seven days. You better start getting the, the animals ready. And that's actually what he has to do right here. So he tells them right there that he's going to kill every, it says, every living substance is the word that God says. That I have made will I destroy from off the face of the earth. Verse 5. And Noah did according unto all that the Lord commanded him. Compare that to, to chapter 5, verse 22, the last verse in the last chapter that we read. Thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so did he. You also see similar statements about Moses in this same way. That he finished everything that God had commanded him to do when it comes to, you know, building the Ark of the Covenant. When it comes to preparing the tabernacle and all of those things. It says, thus did Moses. We're talking about how he finished all the commandments. So you can see, you know, the obedience. Not only the great faith that Noah had, but you also see the great obedience, the works. He also had works. Look at verse 6. And Noah was 600 years old when the flood of waters was upon the earth. And Noah went in and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him into the ark because of the waters of the flood. Of clean beasts and of beasts that are not clean and of fowls and of everything that creepeth upon the earth. He says, verse 9, there went in two and two unto Noah into the ark, the male and the female. So notice that time it says two and two. That's speaking specifically about the animals that are going to be uh, uh, preserved in order to preserve life and to replenish the earth. <clears throat> says the male and the female as God had commanded Noah. Verse 10, and it came to pass after seven days that the waters of the flood were upon the earth. Now, I don't know if you ever noticed this either, but he gives him that seven-day warning. And at the time that he gives him the warning, that's when the animals are put on the ark. The animals are actually on the ark and waiting for seven days. If you read that one more time, notice verse 9 and verse 10. They went in two and two unto Noah into the ark, the male and the female, as God had commanded Noah. And it came to pass after seven days that the waters of the flood were upon the earth. So that implies that the animals were on the ark prior to that. And then it says in verse 11 that it'll tell you that this is when Noah actually boards the ark. I believe it's verse 11. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the seventh day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up. And the windows of heaven, no, I'm sorry, it's verse 13. Keep reading though. And the windows of heaven were opened, and the rain was upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. Now look at verse 13, and we're going to come back to verse 11. In the selfsame day entered Noah and Shem and Ham and Japheth, the sons of Noah and Noah's wife, wife, Noah's wife, and the three wives of his sons with them 
into the ark. So notice that Noah did not enter seven days prior. Noah entered the self same day. Now go back to verse number 11. There's a couple of things that I want to look at here. <clears throat> verse number 11. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month. So it gives you the, to the exact day. The same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up. And then it says this, and the windows of heaven were open. I want you to turn over to Deuteronomy chapter number 8, verse number 7. Deuteronomy chapter number 8, verse number 7. Every single time that you look up uh, the word fountain, or fountain of the deep, fountains of the deep, uh, you, you, you search just a combination of those words repeatedly, it all comes up with the same type of concept. Now, just the definition of the word fountain, of, of the operation of a fountain and what it does, is that it, it, is, it is a spring of water that sprays water upwardly. Now, there are many people that argue with this, what I'm about to say here in just a moment, and they try to make the fountains of the great deep breaking open and the waters of the flood, is, and, uh, referring to, or the waters of the rain, the same thing. When it says the windows of heaven were open and it rained, They'll try to say that that's the same thing as the fountains of the great deep. But every time you look up a fountain, let's just look at the definition of the word in the English language, fountain. It, has, it does not mean water coming downward. It always means water coming upward. That is the definition of a fountain. Every time you look up the, the word fountain, fountain of the deep, all these types of, of words, fountain, springs, you just type that in. Every time it describes our normal word of fountain, water spraying upward in an upward direction. <clears throat> so look at Deuteronomy chapter number 8, verse number 7, and I'll show you a good example of this. It says in Deuteronomy 8, 7, For the Lord thy God bringeth thee into a good land, a land of brooks of water, and it says, of fountains and depths that spring out of valleys and hills. So notice, it, even in the very same word where it mentions fountains, it mentions a spring or springs. Why do we call them springs? Same exact reason. What does spring mean? Just the general word of spring. Something is going in an upward motion, right? And that is what a fountain is. A fountain is something that, that goes upward. Now, a lot of people will attack the Bible from a scientific perspective. And they, they'll mock and ridicule you know, the story of Noah's Ark. We believe the story of Noah's Ark, and we're not embarrassed by that. Just yeah. like God was not embarrassed and ashamed that he was the one that was going to destroy the whole world, he said, I and I, I'm not ashamed at all, I'm not embarrassed at all that the story of Noah's flood happened, the Bible teaches that. That doesn't embarrass me at all. I wholeheartedly accept it and believe it. And the person that should be embarrassed is the person that has to look around at all this evidence that proves that there was a worldwide flood, and then in the face of science, they, they try to say, well, the, no, the flood didn't really happen. When there is just proof after proof, evidence after evidence, you know, there's something called erosion, right? And it, it, it happens on a miniature scale, but it, it can, of course, happen on a massive scale. And there is, you know, proofs and evidence, evidence of erosion on every continent, all around the world. Massive amounts of erosion that took place all around this world. Of, of water. Just on every... I mean, look at the Grand Canyon. It's massive amounts of erosion that took place. There are so many proofs. There are over 400 legends, 400 cultures that have different legends of a flood that took place. Did you know that? 400 of them. 400 cultures that teach and believe in some sort of worldwide flood. Not just a local flood, but a worldwide flood. 400 of them. And this is the best proof. This is the best proof. Of course, this is like, I just turned into Ken Hovind up here. I'm giving him all this stuff. But here's the thing. This is the best proof of all of them. All the creation scientists use this. Mount Everest is the highest, is the, is the, the, the highest elevated mountain in, the highest elevated part of land. Mountain, if you will, in the world. It's like 29,000 feet. It's extremely, above sea level, of course. That's what they always the gauge is sea level. 29,000 feet above sea level. And on the top of Mount Everest, there are just tons of fossilized and petrified clams. At the highest point in the world, clams in Asia. It's like, in the, it's like, it's near China. It's nowhere near the ocean. Do you realize that, right? It's nowhere near the ocean, and it's the highest point in the world. 
I don't know how scientists ignore this. 29,000 feet. Do you really understand how crazy this is? 29,000 feet. The highest mountain in the world, there are petrified clams. Does anyone know what a clam is? A clam, it's a, mu it's a mollusk, right? And mollusks are like snails and things like that. They're invertebrates. They don't have, they don't have like a back, they, they're, you know, they're just muscles basically, right? They don't have a spine. So what a clam does at the moment, this is what's even more interesting that proves that there was a flood. What a clam does at the moment that it dies, because it's all muscles, it relaxes and automatically opens. This is a scientific fact. All of these petrified clams are all closed. Every last one of them. Do you know the only explanation to that and the only time that that's ever observed? Is when they're rapidly buried. It has to be obviously rapidly buried. That's the only way that they could all die and just not open up when they die. All of there's, I mean, there's hundreds, if not thousands, I don't know how many, but there are numerous. Numerous clams at the highest point in the world. The highest point in the world. The highest mountain. Um, look at verse 19. And the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth. Look what it says. And all the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered. Do you know what that includes? Mount Everest. And do you know what makes perfect sense? I mean, if something like cataclysmic like that, things are being shifted around. Sediment, sand, rock, all kind. I mean, the world is, the entire world, imagine the tidal waves that are taking place when the whole world is covered in water. I mean, it would be massive. So things are being thrown around everywhere. You know, and, and obviously mountains to the degree that, that they exist today probably weren't at that degree or that extent. You know, they weren't as big as they were, right? And a lot of them were probably created from all of the erosion and all the water. I mean, imagine that force, you know how strong water is? Imagine all that force just being thrown around. You know, and, and that's what creates you know, like the Grand Canyon. And you have, uh, what is the, it's, it's super faint, it just slipped my mind. What is the massive lake that is above the Grand Canyon? It's like, it's super well known. Super well known. And I've said it a million times, but I can't remember what it is. There's a massive, huge lake that's above the Grand Canyon, right above the Grand Canyon. And, and I've noticed this, this is just a personal observation of my own, that you have the Grand Canyon where a lot of these uh, erosions and formations you know, right around the Grand Canyon where there's just this massive, you know, canyon where you can see that water cut through the, the, the earth right there. But then you know what you have just south of that as well? If you just look at a map, you have like miniature formations. You understand what I'm saying? Like in the Arizona area, like Phoenix, like it's just less, you know, less and less as you go down south from that point. So it's, it's almost like that the water, just like you would expect, that lake that exists up there, you know, a dam busted, whatever it may be, and cut the Grand Canyon out. But then I started thinking about when I lived in Arizona and Phoenix, that you, it's not like you would just cut the Grand Canyon out and then all the water is gone, right? No, a little bit, a lot of it would stay there, and it would slowly, you know, uh, be left behind. So you would, that's what, exactly what you would expect just from a scientific observation to where, you know, there would be less and less formations that would take place just slowly. So you would expect erosion even past the Grand Canyon, but not to the same extent. And that's what you see. What is the, did you look it up? It's like the Powell Havasu. Okay, isn't there, it wasn't, isn't there a, I thought there was a. Grand Lake and Hobie Lake. Grand Lake and Hobie Lake, like a huge lake, yeah. I know there's like a massive one that's just above it, and it may be quite a bit farther, you know what I mean? But I know that there's a huge lake. And even scientists will say that there's, you know, a, a, a massive lake. It even used to be bigger than it is now. That there, it used to be a huge lake, like, around that period of time. Whatever, you know, just the studies that they've done. Not only that, you can find, you know, a, a, you know a marine biology, different types of, of living, like, aquatic animals on every continent and every area. Like, the middle of the United States, they'll dig and they'll find, like, dead fish. In, like, the middle of the United like. There's so much proof that there was a worldwide flood. You have to be an idiot to admit it. But do you know what happens? When you admit there's a worldwide flood, like, no pun intended, you just open the floodgates for the Bible to be true. Yeah. Really. Like, it, it's, it's like, what, else, what other, you know, why do we have this book that tell? they want to mock the Bible, right? But then why do we have this book that is just so accurate about all these events? So then it just makes that much, you know, that much harder to deny that the Bible is factual. If a person admits, well, you know, there was actually a worldwide flood, right? 
And you know, something, you know, another thing that atheists will say about the story, I've heard them say about the story of, uh, of Noah and the ark, is they'll often say, they'll, always, they'll often make the claim like, you know, is Noah the only one that owned, owned a boat? Like, couldn't other people go on a boat? But here's the problem. The fountains of the great deep broke open too, buddy. So it, it, this is, you know, imagine, I mean, massive fountains, like, like just like, and, and here's the thing, too, there's also scientific proof that there are springs of water, you know, these are secular scientists, I'm saying, believe this, and have, and have studied this. There are springs of water in the crust of the earth, that exist in the crust of the earth, like massive amounts of water, and that's exactly what the Bible is teaching, that the fountains of the great deep broke open. Something broke open from the inside of the, of the earth. And there was a fountain there where water was, water was gushing out. This also explains another a atheistic uh, challenge to the Bible. Because they all you know, talk about, uh, you know, how, you know, when it snows or when it, or when it rains, it creates a barrier, right? A barrier around the earth and it, and it keeps, it'll keep the heat in. That's why it's when it's humid, right? It's, it's keeping all the heat in. It creates this, you know, uh, uh, like cloud cover. You know what I mean? We'll, we'll make it more hot. So scientists will often say, well, if, you know, if it rained enough to flood the entire earth, this is another one of their challenges to mock the Bible. If it rained enough to, you know, to flood the entire earth, you know, the heat would get to the point where it would just like boil everything. And no one would be able to exist. Yeah, here, you know, there's multiple problems with that. You know, about, again, scientifically. Number one, all the formations didn't exist of the earth today. It was a lot of what the, the high mountains and everything were caused by the flood, number one. So it would be much easier to cover the entire earth with less water because there aren't these huge hills and everything to cover the highest hill. Number one. And then number two, the majority of the water probably didn't come. We have two, lo we have two right. locations the water's coming from. The majority of the water probably came from the fountains of the great deep. And here's the thing. You're not going to, you know, when the fountains of the great deep bust open, and if it is, like people have theorized, like Ken Hoven, the fault lines, that's a lot of water coming out of massive cracks. I mean, huge, right? If that is it, you think you're going to have time to go get in your boat real quick, your wooden ship that's got no top to it, or anything, you think you're going to be able to do that? Not a chance. You think you're going to be able to provide, oh, I better go you know, uh, supply enough food for myself for 40 days and 40 nights. No, it's longer than 40 days and 40 nights. It tells you at the very end, it said the waters prevailed upon the earth 150 days. So it's 150 days. You think once the fountains of the great deep bust open, you're going to go get all of your family, have, you know, you're going to provide or supply yourself with enough food to survive for 150 days. You see how these claims just don't work out? You know, they make these stupid statements and they think that they're sly. Like, oh, then didn't somebody else own a boat other than you know, Noah? It's like... It's silliness when you really actually think it out. No, the Bible's the one that's scientific. These retarded atheists are the ones that are not scientific. Right. What they do is they turn science on its head in order to reject the Bible. That's really what they do. Right. The Bible is perfectly scientific, and all the stories make perfect sense. And actually, if you look at the Bible and the stories of the Bible, and then you look at the world around you, it explains science. It makes perfect sense with science. Look at... Yeah. Uh, Verse number 12, we'll read it again. We, we believe this literally. And the rain was upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. In the selfsame day entered Noah and Shem and Ham and Japheth, the sons of Noah, and Noah's wife and the three wives of his sons with them into the ark. They and every beast after his kind and all the cattle after their kind and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth after his kind and every fowl after his kind. Every bird of every sort. And they went in unto Noah, into the ark, two and two of all flesh, wherein is the breath of life. <clears throat> and they that went in, went in male and female of all flesh. And it says this, as God ha had commanded him. And then it says this, super interesting. And the Lord shut him in. So what you have is a perfect picture of salvation. Now they were saved physically, right? The Bible says that that is a picture of the death, burial, and resurrection also of Jesus Christ. It tells you that in 1 Peter chapter number 3. So it represents, you know, salvation. You know, that, like I said last week, there's one door. And what did Jesus say? I am the door. You know, it, by me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. So that one door represented 
Jesus Christ. There was only one door. And I want you to think about this too. There was one door and then there was a window. So you don't really have, once you're on this ark, you don't really have like, like an exit, like an escape chute or anything. You're, once you get on that ark, you're not getting out. You know what it's a perfect picture of? Not only salvation, but eternal security. Like it says right there, and the Lord shut him in. God was the one preserving them once they got on that ark. Once you're saved, God keeps you saved. That's why Jesus said, you know, uh, he, he tells you that no man is going to pluck you out of his hand. Amen. If you believe on him, you'll never perish. And he says, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. You know, even Paul talks about how, you know, he is persuaded that, that, that whom he hath believed is able to keep it. You know, God is the one that's keeping him. God is the one that's preserving him. You have like a perfect picture of salvation also in the sense of the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of you and that is what seals you and God says come into the ark was, was God like physically dwelling in the ark no but he was spiritually dwelling in the ark his spirit was in the ark obviously God is a spirit so notice the Holy Spirit is inside of the ark so it's like a picture of your body and then God dwelling inside of you and that's what seals you God is the one that seals you God is the one that keep them, kept them God is the one that keeps our salvation once we're saved. You don't need to do anything else, and it doesn't matter. Even if you wanted to be unsaved, you're already on the ark, buddy. You're not going anywhere. If you're like, man, I just want out of here. You can look around everywhere, but there's no escape chute. There's no way to get off. You're not getting out of that ark until the waters are over. You know, we're sealed until the day of redemption. Amen. Until, you know, the waters came down. You know, uh, they, they prevailed, but then they came down, they were abated, and then he's like, okay, now that you're in heaven, now that the waters are down, you can, you can go. Yeah, you can fight with God even if you wanted to. No man means yourself. You know, Pentecostals will oftentimes, when you take them to that, that verse, John 10, 28, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. They'll often say, like, yeah, but you can, this is a super famous statement that they say, yeah, but you can jump out of your hand, jump out of their hand, out of his hand. Have you ever heard that? Anyone ever heard them say that? That's a super famous Pentecostal statement. Super famous. I want to, obviously, some, you know, popular, someone popularized that from their movement. You're a man too, buddy. You're not getting yourself out. Noah wasn't getting out of that ark whether he wanted to get out or not. It didn't matter. It didn't matter. If he decided, like, I just want to die. Like his wife is driving him crazy. No, I'm just kidding. He's like, I'm getting out of here. You're not getting out. The Lord shut him in. And you know who opened the door? He's the one that says, go. Look at, uh, flip over. Let's look at this. Verse 15, chapter 8, verse 15. And God spake unto Noah, saying, go forth of the ark, thou and thy wife. Why is he telling him to go? Because God's obviously the one that opened the door. The same guy that shut the door is the one that opened the door. You understand what I'm saying? So, they can't open the door is the point. They needed God to shut the door. They needed God to open the door. God is the one that kept them. God is the one that preserves your salvation. Once you believe, God keeps you. Once you put your trust and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're saved forever and nothing can change that. And this is a perfect picture of eternal security. The Lord shut them in. Amen. <clears throat> Look at verse 17. And the flood was 40 days upon the earth, and the waters increased and bare up the ark, and it was lifted up above the earth. Verse 18, And the waters prevailed and were increased greatly upon the earth, and the ark went upon the face of the waters. And the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth, and all the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered. It's a perfect picture of, like I said, the resurrection. And the Bible tells you that in 1 Peter chapter number 3, how the ark rising above the waters is a picture of the resurrection. And what do you have going on here? It says, verse 17, And the flood was forty days upon the earth, and the waters increased. And it says this, And bear up the ark, and it was lift up above the earth. So there's a couple of things that that can symbolize. Jesus said that he was going to be lifted up. So it pictures him lifted up on the cross, but then it also pictures him rising again from the dead as well, you could say. How he rose again from the dead. That's what 1 Peter 3 tells you, that it pictures the resurrection. 
So that's what you have here. You have hell often being symbolized as the deep. You know, to talk about uh, Leviathan living in the deep. And you have Jesus Christ rising again from the dead, coming up out of the deep, if you will, right? And prevailing over the waters, prevailing over the deep. And he has the, the keys of hell and of death. You know, so uh, great symbolism that we can see here. Look at verse number uh, 19 one more time. We'll read that again. And the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth, and all the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered. It says, verse 20, 15 cubits upward did the waters prevail, and the mountains were covered. So 15 cubits, if you remember, that was also the height of the ark. So that's 45 feet. So the same height of the ark, 45 feet, is the same distance in which the, uh, the highest mountain was covered. So that's the highest mountain was at least 45 feet under the water. <clears throat> Look at verse number 21. And all flesh died that moved upon the earth, both of fowl and of cattle and of beasts and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth and every man. So that's real clear. All flesh died that moved upon the earth. Anything that, that moved and lived upon dry land was dead. It even stresses that more, like verse 22. All in whose nostrils was the breath of life of all that was in the dry land died. Now that's a very good verse to turn atheist to, verse number 22, because what is often you know, another uh, objection that they want to bring up? Did you take alligators with you, too? Or fish, or octopus? Have you, anybody heard that? Yeah. Tons of times. No, idiot. All that was in the dry land died. They're going to be okay. They'll be all right in the water, right? And I thought about this too. Another just personal observation I've had is uh, notice what type of animal has the, the widest variation within, it, within kinds. Dry land animals or like marine biology? What does? What has the most variation? By far, doesn't it? It's like they're discovering new species like constantly in the, in the sea. Like literally it's like every few days they discover a new type of fish. And if you think, they had another 2,000 years to multiply. You understand what I'm saying? They weren't killed off. So that variation from the beginning is still there. And they're just continually just, you know, this one fish that goes back to the line that was over here. I mean, they just continually spread out as opposed to it was funneled off for all the dry land animals. You understand what I'm saying? So it makes perfect sense why. And plus, of course, the way that they multiply and they have much more room now, you know, in that sense as well. But that makes sense with, with the dry, all the dry land animals, you know, being eliminated, but two, right, of each kind. And then uh, such a, a wide uh, range of different kinds of marine biology. Look at verse number 23. And every living substance was destroyed, which was upon the face of the ground, both man and cattle and the creeping things, and the fowl of the heaven, and they were destroyed from the earth. And then it says this, And Noah only remained alive, and they that were with him in the ark. And the waters prevailed upon the earth in 150 days. So I'm going to be done a little bit early, but there is a statement that I want to focus on here for a few minutes. It's at the end of verse number 23. It says, And Noah only remained alive, and they that were with him in the ark. I want you to turn to Ezekiel chapter number 14. Ezekiel chapter number 14. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel there in the major prophets in your Bible. Ezekiel chapter number 14. And I want you to look at, we're going to read verse number 14 here in just a moment. But I want you to notice that statement that we read, that I, that I reread just there for a moment. And Noah only remained alive. And they that were with him in the ark. Who is the emphasis put on there? Noah. Noah. So what does it infer? What does it just go ahead and imply there in the Bible when it says they that were with him? Noah's the only one Exactly. So the only reason why the others were saved was not because of things that they had done or because of their great faith or because they found grace in the eyes of the Lord. What was the reason why his family was saved? Because of Noah. So I want you to notice that. Notice the wording. And Noah only remained alive. Notice how it makes that blanket statement as well. Because if it were to end right there, it would not be true. But he wants to put the emphasis on specifically Noah only 
remained alive. And then he says, and they that were with him in the ark. Don't look over at Ezekiel chapter number 14, verse number 14. This is actually a truth that is further elaborated on here. Though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, they should deliver but their own souls by their righteousness, saith the Lord God. Now, here in verse number 14, we have three people that are mentioned. Noah, Daniel, and Job. And you know what you have going on in a very similar situation with these two men is you have them, or the other two outside of Noah, of course, is you have them being just great men of God. Great men of God. Another person that I think of, you know, that was saved from a similar situation, it says that he vexed his righteous soul, but it's Lot. Lot vexed, vexed his righteous soul, but God did spare Lot, didn't he? God did spare Lot, even though he was in Sodom and Gomorrah. He spared Lot, and who else did he spare? He said, is there anybody else here with you? So, was it because of, of them? No, it didn't even, he was just asking them because he didn't even know. It was an angel. He didn't even know. But he's like, no, for your sake, we can get a couple other people out of here. Why? Because Lot obviously had some righteousness, didn't he? He vexed his righteous soul. So, because of his righteousness, he was going to spare other people. You notice that? God was going to spare other people. We see the same statement here. If Noah, Daniel, and Job were in this city... He says but that they would be delivered only. So you know what it's saying? That this city is so wicked, how wicked everyone else is, that if God were to bring judgment at that time upon Israel, that God wouldn't have spared Noah's family. God would have only allowed Noah to be delivered because of how sinful and wicked he's talking about the Jeremiah and you know, Jerusalem and Israel was at that time. You know, And it'll talk about Samaria, of course, and Ezekiel, that they're both spoken of. Uh, as being separate cities. But when we go back to Genesis chapter number 7, we, we, we learn a great truth right here at the end of Genesis chapter number 7 about why Noah's family was really spared. And we know that one of them was a, a sodomite. He was a reprimand, right? So these people were not spared because of good things that they had done or because of their great faith, were they? They were only spared because of Noah's great faith. And because of, I'm sure there was an element of Noah's obedience as well. But it says that he found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And you say, well, you know, because uh, somebody, you can kind of, people can say, well, I thought it's because of his obedience and things like that. Here's the thing. When we really come down to it, nobody deserves anything. Right. You don't deserve anything. Noah, des here, listen to this. Noah deserved and his family deserved to die in that flood. Because Noah deserves to go to hell. Noah's not good enough. That's what Noah deserves. Noah deserved to go to hell. All of his family deserved to go to hell. Right? But he found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Amen. Now, if you want to... I believe that the righteousness is because of his great faith. That's what I believe because that's what Hebrews 11, 7 says. But you can apply this also to, you know, living a righteous life even. Men, especially being the heads of the household... There are so many examples of the importance of men taking responsibility for their family and, and, and uh, you know, putting forth a good example for your family. And, you know, what you can do for your family, for your wife, and for your children is you can salvage them in many different ways. You can save them from God's judgment. And you want to know a great way that you can do that? Just by setting the good example of reading your Bible every day. Reading your Bible every day. That's a simple, a simple way of, of putting your whole entire family on the path of righteousness. That may not seem like a lot to you, but when you start reading your Bible every day and you get your wife to read your, her Bible every day and you get your children to read their Bible every day, setting the example and then getting them to do that as well. Obviously, you know us that are Bible believers, we know that that causes a dramatic change in someone's life. Over the course or the period of years. You don't know what type of sin that you could be saving your children from. You don't know what type of sin that you could be saving your wife from in these type of situations. But not only that. Not only that. Just like with Job. What did Job do? Job went and sacrificed for his children. Didn't he? Job had children that you know may or may not have been living the, the best life. But Job tried to cover for them anyways. Didn't he? 
So when you decide, this is the point, all of that to say this, when you decide as the man of the house, or when you decide as being the leader, or when you decide as being any, in any sort of position of authority where people are looking up to you spiritually, that you're going to start slacking off, there's a very good chance that you're not only bringing God's wrath upon yourself, but upon other people as well. Noah's righteousness in this particular situation saved his family. His entire family from a gruesome death. And they were, they were enabled to live for hundreds of more years when you read about it. Have children, you know, experience all different types of things in their life. All, you know, all the other joys and blessings that come with living a, a, a long life. Living a long life is a blessing. So the fact that Noah himself lived a righteous life was not only good for Noah, but it was good for his family as well. Even if you were in a situation where your wife was disobedient and your children weren't listening to you, just by you doing that which is right might save them. I'm not talking about spiritually, but physically. God may give them maybe a few more years to live when God would want to punish them. Think about that. Maybe, let's, th let's think about this too. What if there's a man? Let's look at an extreme situation. What if there's a man who gets saved? His wife is not saved and he has three or four children. His wife is just living a, 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 just a wicked life, the same life maybe that he used to live and he got saved and then changed his life. His children are being influenced by that and, and you know, she just keeps on living that type of life, right? Well, he, for the next 10 years, continually grows, you know, grows in grace, grows in the knowledge of the Lord, is going to church more, he's reading his Bible more. He's just growing as a Christian, right? What if, you know, after 10 years, God was actually going to maybe take the, take the life of his wife? Maybe, maybe just because of her disobedience in some area, something happened, whatever it may be, that God's wrath was going to be coming down upon the family for something that she had done. Think about this. But God allowed her maybe to live a little bit longer. A little bit longer because of his righteousness. I'm just giving you a hypothetical situation. And maybe three, four, five years later, she was then receptive to the gospel. I mean, that's just a hypothetical scenario, just a hypothetical situation. But the point is, it's a fact that God will spare other people, will spare other people because you as a leader live a righteous life. He'll spare other people that live around you. So you're not only affecting yourself, you're affecting other people too. The, uh, the man that took the Babylonian garment, Achan, you know what happened? He was killed and burnt, and so were his, his children and his wife. Daniel, after Daniel was, uh, was freed from the, the lion's den, you know what happened? The men that accused him were taken, and you know who else? Their families were taken and thrown in there too. So you know whose fault it was? That was the reverse. That was the opposite. The leader's fault. So you can see in this case, Noah being the leader, Noah being a righteous man, how it impacted his life. And it, and it allowed them to be the only other seven people that were preserved in, a, in an event like this. And you look at it, think about this as well. You look at how extreme this is. Because you have somebody like Ham that God was even, in this case, willing to spare for Noah's sake. Now, you don't know how long he had been in the state that he was in before that or whatever. But still, you see God even willing to spare just because they're Noah's children. Just because they're Noah's children, God was willing to spare their lives. The point is, as a leader, you see how important it is to live a righteous life. Not just for yourself but for your wife and for your kids. Not just because you don't want to be punished, but if it motivates you more, maybe you should think about your children and your wives. Maybe that's what you should think. Maybe that is more of a motivation for you because you can spare your family from judgment, possibly. If, they, if God's going to be coming down on them. If God's going to be giving them wrath, maybe God would actually spare them in some cases because 
of your righteousness, because of the life that you had lived. You know what? The reverse could be true as well. Because of your wickedness, just like those, those men that accused Daniel, your family could die because of a wicked life that you lived. The, just like, uh, what was the other situation with Achan? Because of the transgression, that came from God as well. Because of that transgression, they died as well too. So you see the wickedness can also bring the opposite down upon you as well. So you see the importance of being the leader. Just like Noah was. Noah was the leader of his family. And we see that Noah was able, in this case, to preserve not only his own soul, physically in this case, but his family's as well. So we shouldn't, you know, uh, we shouldn't take that responsibility lightly as men. That should be very important unto us. And we should care not only about ourselves, but be selfless. <coughs> think about your families. Think about your wives. Think about your children. And how you're actually not only just saving yourself, you're saving them as well in some cases. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you, dear Lord, for great examples like Noah. Dear Lord, we ask you that you would be with us, dear Heavenly Father. Uh, we ask you that you would bless us, bless uh, uh, Pastor Coleman in their situation, dear Lord God. And uh, we ask you that you would just continually bless our church. And we thank you for all the blessings that you've given us thus far as a church. And in Jesus Christ's name, amen.